Ladies and gentlemen, today let's just sit down and have a little talk. As it turns out, I've never really talked a lot about, you know, my own history with computer science, at least not, you know, in a concise manner in a single video. So why not talk about it? Of course, the reason why I'm doing this is not out of vanity. You see, sometimes I get questions regarding, you know, computer science careers or computer science education, how to get through it, how to survive it. And a lot of the time, I sort of struggle to give answers that are reasonably good, you know, for the reason that I've had my own type of background, you've had yours, it's not the same. In other cases, people actually ask, you know, questions about how they can develop things themselves, and my answers have always been kind of patchy. Having been self-taught for a very long time, I thought, well, I can actually sort of share my experiences on self-learning when it comes to computer science. Hopefully that gives you some kind of a reference point. Honestly, I don't know how useful this video is going to be for you. This is just going to be me sitting down and telling you a story. So yeah, with that said, let us jump right in. You're watching another Random Wednesday episode on 0612 TV. <laughs> Hello and welcome back to another random Wednesday episode. Now, this episode is going to be story time. I don't know how useful this is going to be for you. So yeah, hopefully you know that going in. Anyway, let's begin. My personal experience with computers went back a very long way. There was a computer in the house ever since I was like a toddler. And I was told that I was actually playing with the computer from a very young age. So that is point number one. Interest was built up from a very long time ago, and I'm sure that plays a very huge part in where I am today. Fast forward a few years, when I was about 9 or 10, my dad was actually sent, you know, by his workplace to a course, and one part of the course actually includes some materials on programming. So he brought that stuff home, he put it down on the table, and well, I went through that stuff. For whatever reason, you know, the programming part jumped out at me, so I decided to give it a try and see what things are like. So this is actually learning point number two, because this is where an interest actually was translated into, you know, actively pursuing that interest. And the whole point about being good at programming is having lots of practice. It's about tackling different problems and sort of just letting things in your mind click. Having developed that interest early on in my life, I sort of had that curiosity to want to find out more and to try and build programs that did things. So yeah, that was actually when I started to get a lot of my practice. By tackling problems that arose entirely out of my own interest, I sort of learned in a very comfortable exploratory manner. And I'm sure that helped a lot in sort of shaping my basic thinking skills when it comes to programming. Around that time, I was given my first portable gizmo and that was a Sony Clear PDA. This device was sort of the early precursor to smartphones. It actually ran Palm OS. You can actually download what we now call apps from you know places online. There was no such thing as an app store. That thing didn't even connect to the internet. But well, I was able to actually find apps online and sort of load them to the device and play with them. The app that I unquestionably spent the most time in is what was called Plua. In fact, it was actually Lua for Palm. I think till date, Plua is one of the languages that I've spent the most time using. Again, I spent a lot of time actually exploring on my own, you know, thinking of whatever it is I wanted to do and then actually building it in Plua. What's interesting about using this particular programming language is that it's not a sort of very huge, very industry standard kind of language. In fact, it was maintained by a very small team if I remember correctly. And what that means is there were subtle bugs and subtle issues here and there that sort of made things just a little bit more challenging. What this means is a good part of my learning process was also about sort of working around these problems. And I guess that is point number three. Using exploratory methods to develop problem solving skills can also be really good for, you know, just building up your general computer science knowledge. Having the ability to sort of identify where problems are, where they come from, as well as, you know, alternative routes to work around these problems, you know, especially when they're not your fault, that is actually a very valuable skill. Also around that same time, I was actually kind of into game development. 
So I downloaded this free thing called RPG Toolkit. I don't know if it even exists on the internet anymore, but yeah, basically it lets you make simple tile-based games and it sort of had its own built-in scripting language. So yeah, I played around with that quite a bit as well. So yeah, back then I had a pretty large-scale game project that I was working on for quite a few months before, you know, I just lost interest. But I guess this is learning points number four. A lot of people want to do programming because they want to make games. In fact, that tends to be, you know, the first motivation for a lot of people who get into programming. Of course, most of these people don't actually end up making games because first of all, it's not as easy as they thought. And second, well, that passion needs to sort of, you know, keep on being there. And that's not easy. It's never easy to sort of sustain an interest for a long period of time. But that's not necessarily a bad thing because at the end of the day, you've still picked up the important skills you need to actually, well, program and code. So yeah, that's roughly where I was in my childhood. When I was 10, I was sort of looking at these different ways of programming. Things sort of remained stagnant that way for a couple of years until I was about 15 or 16. That was where I actually began my formal education in computer science. I went into what we call junior college here, which I guess is sort of synonymous with high school in other countries. You know, whatever that is, that thing that you do right before you go into university. I went for a computing course and that's where I did, you know, real hardcore programming for the first time in C++. The interesting thing for me is that I had to actually unlearn a lot of the wrong things that I was doing and relearn the right things in its place. So I guess that's learning point number five. When you self-learn, it's great because you're exploring things directly in line with your interests. The problem is because there's nobody to sort of stand over your shoulder and correct you when you do wrong things, you sort of internalize the wrong things as right things. You know, they become habitual, you become you're very used to doing them. The problem arises when sort of the real world comes along and hits you in the face and you realize that these things that have become second nature are actually wrong. It actually takes more effort to unlearn that wrong thing and relearn the right thing. So that is actually one disadvantage of self-learning. Of course, that's not anywhere as bad as it sounds. During that time, I also learned a lot of smart and good things. Things that made me go, oh, that's much easier than how I was doing it. And I guess that's sort of an add-on to point five, but I'm going to call this point six anyway. That is, when you're actually sort of forced to learn programming in school, you actually learn things that you don't originally feel very motivated to learn. One example of this is object-oriented programming. Now, back in the day, I've already heard of it, and I've always looked at it and, you know, without fully understanding it, sort of dismissed it, sort of felt that I don't really need to do things this way because, well, the way I do it also works. And that's kind of an okay argument to a certain extent, but when school sort of forces you to learn something like OOP, you then realize that, hey, that was actually extremely useful and a lot of things that I've done previously could be made easier if I did things that way. So yeah, I guess that's another point for formal education in computer science. You pick up good skills that, you know, you may have actually overlooked and they may be extremely helpful for you. So yeah, two years of my life was devoted to a little bit of computer science theory here and there, as well as a lot of C++ programming. After my junior college days, I had a two-year break while I was in the army, and after that, I actually went to university and took my CS course. That was, of course, when everything sort of really came together, where I started to move on to really high-level stuff. Thanks to my previous background, you know, both in high school as well as from before, much of what I'm seeing in my CS career in university was not really new. Even if a piece of information was something I'd never seen before, I could base it off the things I already knew and sort of build up that knowledge from that. So yeah, what this tells us of course is learning point number seven. Well, having a background is great. If you are sort of youngish and you wanna actually do you know, a computer science career in the future, Gathering a strong background at this point is great. It's going to be useful for you in so many ways. Like I've mentioned earlier, of course, there are disadvantages. Of course, you may have to unlearn certain bad habits you've picked up. But on the whole, it's great for you, which is why I've always encouraged people to pursue that interest as early on as they possibly can. 
It's just so advantageous. But anyway, my four years in university sort of exposed me to even more things that, you know, I didn't think was important, I didn't actually try and actively pursue. And yeah, surprisingly, a lot of that stuff is kind of theoretical in nature, which I guess is sort of in line with what a university is supposed to do. For example, in the past, I never really cared about optimized algorithms. I never really cared about wasting time doing certain computations or wasting memory. But in school, you're kind of forced to think about these things. Even if in the real world, you know, you have a lot of computational power, you don't have to worry too much about building fast algorithms. What you'll find is that knowing how to build a fast algorithm also helps you. It helps you in doing things right from the get-go. It helps you in sort of thinking in the right way. So yeah, that's useful skills that you pick up in university. Also, in my four years at university, well, we covered a lot of breadth and a lot of depth. I've learned a whole bunch of different programming languages, a whole bunch of different frameworks, a whole bunch of different thinking methodologies. And each one of these went to quite a good amount of depth. What this means is, at university, you really broaden your horizons. You really are forced to think about many different things in many different ways. That is, of course, good. What that means is, well, you have a lot of experience to draw from. When you actually step out into the real world, when you actually, you know, start working in whatever software engineering or coding positions, well, you have that wealth of experience behind you. Of course, personally for me, I didn't actually go into software engineering. I didn't actually go into a coding position. I guess my true calling in life is education, which is why, well, that is the industry I'm working in right now. So yeah, I guess that is my CS journey. I guess that is, you know, how I've moved from my childhood to where I am today. So yeah, that has been my CS journey over the years. I'm 25 right now. And what that means is if I started at 10, which is you know, pretty fair approximation of where I began. I've been programming for 15 years, more than half of my life. And all this started from a little bit of interest in childhood. And I guess this is where I can squeeze in learning points number eight. Parents, if you think your child might have this sort of interest, or if you want to cultivate this kind of interest in them, start early. Now, I'm not asking you to give them undue amounts of pressure. Please don't do that. If you just feel that you know, they may have that interest, you can always nudge them in the right direction. You can always find resources, find toys that sort of help them build upon this interest. If you're watching this video hoping to take away something and you realize that, well, I've started a lot later than this guy on my screen, don't worry. Starting early is great, but not starting early is still fine. The important thing is that you have that interest, you have that drive there, that will continue to sort of push you to more exploration, more practice. That's ultimately what you need more than anything else. So yeah, I guess I've rambled long enough now. So let's wrap this up. Thank you very much for watching. You know, hopefully this story is at least a little inspirational, a little educational to you. But yeah, that's it. Thank you very much for watching. And until next time, you're watching 0612 TV. Thank you very much for watching. If you like my work and are feeling generous, you can shoot me a one-time donation on PayPal or sign up for a recurring one on Patreon. Of course, you can simply like, comment and subscribe. You know the deal. For more videos, links to my channel and a related playlist are on screen. Thank you for your support.